So uh, welcome everybody to today's uh, edition of uh, our uh, webinar on emerging topics in biomolecular magnetic resonance. Actually, it's the 19th already. Uh, so we, are, we already have a, a good history, I would say. Uh, the, the webinar is organized by Lauren Andreas, Stefan Glöckler, Christian Griesinger, Oscar Milly, Mei Hong, Arthur Palmer and myself. And uh, yeah, uh, we hope to, to uh, present uh, frontier research in magnetic resonance, um, uh, both uh, liquid state as a solid state NMR and occasionally also EPR spectroscopy. Uh, please don't record because we put all the lectures uh, up on speakers concept uh, on the ICMRBS uh, YouTube channel. Uh, just to remind everybody, please don't use the chat, but use the Q&A uh, to put your questions or raise your hand uh, to speak, then we could also unmute you. Uh, finally, uh, as you, as you if, if it's not the first time that you join this, uh, after the official part, uh, you can stay on and uh, we can uh, discuss further questions uh, and anything uh, matters which arise. So thank you again very much. And today we have uh, two fantastic speakers, Remco Sprangas and Yoshitaka Ishii. And uh, Remco actually will be introduced by uh, Louis Kay. Thank you very much, Louis. Uh, the stage is yours. Okay, well, thanks very much. It's a, a real pleasure of mine to introduce uh, Remco Sprangers from the University of Regensburg. Remco was a, a colleague of mine for many years in Toronto and, and, and a friend. And I learned a, a great deal uh, from Remco. But nevertheless, when I was asked by the organizers to introduce him, I was a bit worried since uh, there's been a, a number of my uh, close colleagues who have given uh, talks at, in, in this wonderful session, given wonderful talks actually. And I didn't want to set a, a dangerous precedent of introducing one without uh, having introduced the others. And I spoke to Christian and Art about this and they recognized that that was a serious problem. And so what they did is they contacted all of the former K postdocs who have given uh, seminars in this, uh, in this, um, um, the, 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 uh, the, the series, and they asked them uh, to uh, present additional talks during which time I would introduce them. So if you haven't been introduced by me, it's not a slight, you'll get an opportunity subsequently, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. So in terms of Remco, uh, after an initial uh, introduction to NMR as an undergraduate under the tutelage of Rob Kapteyn, he then went and partnered with Michael Sattler at the EMBL where he did uh, very uh, lovely structural work uh, and also uh, NMR methodology where he focused on developing uh, tools that would uh, facilitate improvements to uh, NMR structures. He then came to Toronto for a postdoc, which is where I got to know him uh, very well. And it's in Toronto that I think Remco fell in love with destruction. Destruction, of course, at the molecular level and using various labeling and spin physics approaches that were floating around in the lab at the time, uh, Remco was able uh, to focus on important uh, molecules that are involved in uh, protein destruction at the time, uh, CLIP P and uh, the proteasome. And he was able to uh, show, I think rather definitively that one could get detailed uh, molecular uh, information about such uh, large uh, systems. Well, he carried his interests uh, in connection with destruction uh, with him as an independent PI, uh, first at uh, Max Planck Institute and subsequently at Regensburg, where he's been uh, interested in mRNA uh, degradation and the various molecular machines that play a role uh, in that. And he's used uh, really a number of uh, uh, elegant uh, technologies, principally NMR, of course, where he's mapped out the molecular details by which mRNA degradation uh, is regulated. In addition to that, he's uh, focused on novel approaches for selective labeling of various components of molecular machines. When you have uh, machines that are composed of multiple components showing that one could label one of the components and not others, and therefore allowing uh, NMR to enter into a whole new uh, realm of uh, various applications. Remco's a real rigorous thinker. He understands the NMR, the biochemistry, and the biology. And I'm sure we're going to uh, uh, enjoy a, a truly outstanding seminar from him. So Remco, the uh, virtual floor is yours. Hey, thanks, thanks a lot, Lewis. Uh, that caught me a bit by surprise. Uh, and I think I'm finished with my talk now because it can't get any better uh, as of here. Um, Okay, um, 
in addition to thanking Lewis, which actually I have to say, I, I'm not sure what you learned from me. I think I, I learned more from you uh, than I've ever learned uh, before. Um, but uh, anyway, okay, let's not get emotional. Um, thanks very much. Uh, also, thanks to the other organizers for putting uh, together this really great uh, uh, lecture series. I really enjoy uh, listening to the NMR talks every week. And I'm very happy to have the opportunity to uh, present my work uh, from our lab here uh, today. So before I start, I also like to acknowledge the funding that we have in the lab. And uh, with that, I'd like to start with my talk. So uh, what we're interested in in the lab is to understand how molecular machines and enzymes function. And um, I think we have a pretty good understanding of uh, uh, the structure and uh, uh, the localization of uh, many molecular machines. Uh, what is however lacking in many cases is uh, our understanding how protein motions are correlated uh, with function. And this is something that we try to uh, address uh, in the lab. And actually in this ni very nice picture from David Gutschel, you can see uh, the proteasome that I uh, worked on uh, in Lewis's lab uh, where I had an absolutely fantastic time. So what we're uh, using in order to uh, visualize those large molecular machines uh, in the NMR is metal trosy spectroscopy, uh, methods that have been developed in Lewis's lab extensively and that we now uh, make very nice use of. Um, using those techniques, we can label uh, specific metal groups with 13CH3 in the almost fully deuterated background in proteins. And we really can record quite high uh, quality NMR spectra at very low temperatures for intermediately sized proteins or even for very large protein complexes at, I'd say, uh, room temperature-like uh, conditions. So today I'm going to talk about two proteins that we studied extensively in the lab. Uh, I'll talk about the DCPS decapping enzyme, which is around 80 kilodalton. It's actually on the small side uh, of the complexes in our lab. And in the second half, I talk about the HISFH complex, which is a key metabolic, metabolic enzyme um, that we studied, uh, uh, study now uh, since uh, uh, recently. Okay, let me start with the DCPS enzyme. Uh, it's a dimeric enzyme. It has two chains, each 40 kilodalton, as you can see here. In the apo form, it's a symmetric protein. It has two active sites, one's located here, one's located here. And when substrate binds, which is a short capped mRNA fragment, which I will show you later, the enzyme undergoes a conformational change and the substrate is embedded in a closed active site that is catalytically competent and can actually do the reaction namely removing the cap structure from this uh, mRNA. On the other side, it's open, and there uh, a second substrate can bind, but it cannot be hydrolyzed because uh, the catalytic residues are not uh, um, close enough to each other. So we wanted to study the uh, conformational changes of this enzyme um, and uh, what actually does, you can see here, so the short cap mRNA is the substrate. This is normally produced by the exosome complex so a long mRNA is degraded, then we have a short kept uh, mRNA fragment. This is recruited to the enzyme here, we get the asymmetric conformation. And then an interesting thing happens, namely that in this closed active site, uh, hydrolysis can take place, then this uh, products can leave the, uh, the enzyme and the enzyme can flip over to start hydrolysis on the other side. And we've got this seesaw kind of motion during the catalytic cycle. And both the substrate binding and the motions here, we wanted to study using uh, metal trosy NMR techniques. So the substrate binding is really easily visualized. Uh, this is a, a zoom of a uh, HMQC spectrum. In the APO form, we've got one peak because both change, uh, for one peak per residue because both change are in the same chemical environment. When we now start to add substrate, we see the appearance of another, of another peak. Uh, and this other resonance is actually the closed side of the enzyme. So basically what we see here is the transition of a symmetric to an asymmetric form of the uh, complex. And when we now uh, continue adding substrate, we can see that the second binding site is slowly occupied uh, with the second substrate. So to visualize the motions in this enzyme, we used uh, longitudinal exchange uh, spectroscopy. So this is a zoom of an HMQC spectrum uh, where we have an additional waiting time. And in this waiting time, the enzyme can flip from the closed open conformation to the open closed conformation. And we get the appearance of those cross peaks uh, uh, here. And we can actually fit this data and get exchange rates. And we can figure out how fast this enzyme flips, open, uh, flips over. And actually the situation is quite uh, similar to the situation that Fleming Hansen had last week, where he had the arginine uh, that can either be in one conformation or the other conformation. We have the same uh, situation here. This is a 50-50 uh, situation. It's either closed or open and, uh, and it's just 
So what we found out is that uh, when we start to add more substrate to the system, uh, we see that those motions increase and increase uh, with increasing substrate concentrations. And we've uh, recently then shown that this actually prevents the uh, efficient catalysis. So it's a uh, substrate inhibition uh, mechanism in this enzyme. So all the work that I've uh, shown so far is being done on a very short substrate. So here you see the cap structure of the mRNA and here you see the RNA body, which only has a single nucleotide in this case. And this is the substrate that the enzyme should be active on. This is a thing that could be produced by the exosome complex. However, in the cell, you don't have only this, you have also very long mRNAs where you have uh, thousands of mRNA of, of nucleotides that form the mRNA body. And this enzyme should not be active on this substrate, otherwise it would start to interfere with uh, cellular function. And we wondered how the enzyme is able to distinguish between something like this and something that has more uh, mRNA nucleotides uh, in the mRNA body. And what we first did is we did a degradation experiment where we prepared those substrate using uh, methods that we developed in the lab. And then we measured the turnover rates for all of those substrates. So here we have a, a very short substrate, the one I talked about in the beginning. And this is turned over with a rate of around 30 per minute. When we now add one extra nucleotide to the substrate, we can see that the uh, degradation rates go down to around eight per minute, but it's still turned over at reasonable speeds. And now if we start to add additional nucleotides to this, uh, to this mRNA, we see that the degradation rates uh, go down to far under uh, uh, 0.3 per minute, which is biologically no longer relevant. So this enzyme definitely has the ability to distinguish between short and long mRNA substrates. And we wondered how the enzyme is doing this. And in order to address this, we uh, went back to metal trozy NMR spectroscopy. Here you see in black the spectrum of the uh, APO protein, the symmetric protein, and in red you see the spectrum of the protein in the asymmetric conformation because the short uh, ligand is being recruited to the enzyme and the asymmetric conformation is being adopted. So when we now repeat this experiment, but now we use an, uh, an mRNA that has one more nucleotide, uh, we see that the asymmetric conformation is still formed because we see the peaks that are uh, representative of the asymmetric uh, conformation of the enzyme. And this is in full agreement with the activity that the enzyme has on this substrate. When we now add one more nucleotide to our mRNA, we clearly see that the uh, enzyme is not able to form the closed active state anymore. So somehow the uh, third nucleotide in the substrate must interfere with the uh, conformational changes that are required in the enzyme. And in order to figure out how this works, uh, we first solve the crystal structure of the uh, uh, enzyme with the shortest possible substrate, namely a cap structure here. And then we have two bases, one base here and one base here. And when we looked at this structure, we saw that this uh, substrate is uh, just uh, having about the same size as the cavity that the enzyme has. So anything longer would not fit in this close active site. Um, previously, however, it was speculated that the mRNA body can leave the active site through this exit tunnel that's been depicted here. Um, so what you see here is the last phosphate group of the, uh, of the substrate and the next uh, nucleotide would actually be positioned in this tunnel here. Um, and this actually, uh, this, this, this next nucleotide will be too big uh, to be uh, fitting in this tunnel here. And in order to regain activity on this complex, we started to mutate residues here to enlarge this exit tunnel. And by doing this, we could actually regain some of the activity uh, because we could now, uh, we had now mutated the enzyme such that it was able to close uh, around the third nucleotide. So having said this, uh, I think uh, what we've seen here is a quite nice mechanism by which a uh, symmetric enzyme can recruit a substrate uh, and then form an asymmetric active site uh, that is required for catalysis. However, when the substrate is too long, it cannot form the active site and catalysis cannot take place. Um, and this, of course, is biologically very relevant because we don't want to have this enzyme floating around uh, and removing the cap structure of random uh, mRNAs that are still required for protein translation uh, in the cell. So with that, I'd like to uh, finish uh, 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 talking about the published work and I'd like to move on to a second subject and this is all unpublished work. Um, it's work that we started in collaboration with our colleague Reinhard Sterner here at uh, Regensburg University and with Matthias Wilmans at the EMBL in, 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 uh, in Hamburg. So basically uh, what we uh, would like to talk about is the His-F, His-H bi enzyme complex that many of you might actually know. 
um, it contains two enzymes. It's got his H enzyme here at the bottom, and this enzyme has a glutaminase active site. What happens in this active site? This, this glutamine is uh, hydrolyzed into glutamate, and in this reaction, ammonium is uh, released. So this ammonium is released and then tra uh, transverses through the tunnel to the active site of the his F enzyme, which actually has a cyclase activity. And this ammonium is in this active site used to transform PR4 into two products, namely ICAR and IMGP, and those are precursors in uh, the purine and histidine biosynthesis pathways. So this is a very central metabolic, uh, metabolic enzyme. The reason we're interested in this enzyme is that this glutaminase activity here is normally extremely low. Um, however, when a um, substrate is recruited to the HISF active site, the activity in this glutaminase active site is increased by uh, 4,500 fold. So in some ways, the two active sites need to talk to each other um, and uh, having a, a substrate here really increases the activity uh, here by a tremendous amount. And this is what interested us. How is this possible? How is this allosteric signal translated from one side in the enzyme to the other side in the enzyme? And clearly many people have looked at this and uh, especially Patrick Loria's lab has done tremendously nice work uh, on trying to unravel this uh, pathway and he's unambiguously shown that protein motions are very important uh, in the translocation of this allosteric signal. So the way we looked at this protein complex is the following. Um, what we did is we labeled his F, the top enzyme, with, pro, uh, with nitrogen and deuterium such that we can record very nice proton-nitrogen correlation maps. Uh, the his H enzyme here at the bottom uh, that has the glutaminase active site is labeled with methyl groups in several amino acids such that we can record methyl trosy spectra that of course can report directly on what is happening in the his H uh, enzyme. So we have one protein where we can independently uh, or one complex in which we can independently visualize uh, both parts. And in addition to this, uh, we've labeled his H with histidine, where the histidine is NMR active at the C2H position in the ring. Uh, and this is very important because the active site of this, uh, his H enzyme contains a histidine that is absolutely uh, essential for catalysis. Okay, so we're using the spectra now to, to, to check uh, how the enzyme is reacting to the different substrates and if we can see the activation of the allosteric uh, communication between the two active sites. So the first thing we did is we take the complex and we add glutamine. And when we add glutamine, which binds to the his H active site here at the bottom, we can see clear chemical sift perturbations close to the active site. This is the active site histidine here. We can see chemical sift perturbations uh, in the his H protein that actually localize to the uh, glutamine binding site, but we hardly see any chemical shift perturbations in the his F enzyme, meaning that the signal is not uh, ending up at the active site of his F. So binding of glutamine only does not activate uh, or does not induce an allosteric signal in the protein. Then we did the experiment the other way around. Uh, this time we're binding uh, a substrate to his F. And I have to say that we're not using the natural substrate because that's too unstable in our hands. We're using PROFAR, which is a substrate analog um, um, that can't, that is not that unstable as the natural substrate. And we can use it for about, uh, for about four or five hours before it's uh, degraded. However, when we add this uh, profile to the HISF active site, we can clearly see the interaction with the HISF enzyme. We can see the chemical shift perturbations. However, in the HISH enzyme, we don't see any, any significant chemical shift perturbations, and especially the active site histidine does not sense that something happens on the other side of the protein. So from this, we conclude that the recruitment of a single substrate is not sufficient to induce uh, an allosteric signal in this protein complex. And we thought, well, maybe the enzyme needs both substrates to be activated. So what we did is we took those, the sample here and we added glutamine in addition, which is going to bind here. And what we then see is a tremendous amount of chemical shift perturbations throughout the whole protein. So in his F, chemical shift perturbations are all over the enzyme. In his H, we get chemical shift perturbations basically everywhere, and especially we get significant chemical shift perturbations at the active site, meaning that when both substrates are binding simultaneously, we get a structural rearrangement of the protein, and the active site is significantly uh, rearranged. 
So with this knowledge, we uh, uh, wondered, of course, how this second structure looks like, how the active state structure looks like. And in order to resolve this, uh, we turned to X-ray crystallography, where we determined the structure of the complex in the presence of both ligands at the same time. And basically, going from the inactive conformation that has been solved uh, years ago uh, to the active conformation that we solved here, there are four major um, structural rearrangements. So the first thing that happens is the uh, recruitment of the his F um, uh, ligand here on top. And what happens is that this loop closes over this, uh, over this uh, substrate here. This leads then to a significant structural rearrangement in the core of the his F protein here and here. There are shifts of helices and sheets. And those shifts then result in a change of the interprotein angle uh, between uh, both proteins here. This goes from around 25 degrees to around 10 degrees. So we have a, a, a compaction of the interface. And this compaction of the interface then results in the formation of the oxyanion hole in the glutamine active site. And this oxyanion hole is, is pivotal for the activity because this uh, stabilizes the reaction intermediates and allows the reaction uh, to take place. So those are static crystal structures, but if we now go back to the NMR and look in our spectra, um, in the APO form, so without any substrate, we get the black spectrum. It's, it's easier to look at the zoom here. We get one peak for each residue, and now we start to add both substrates in saturating amounts. What we see is the formation of the active conformation, as I showed you before, but the inactive conformation is still present. This means that even if both active sites are fully occupied with ligands, we don't have 100% active conformation. And this, of course, uh, is reminiscent of, a, uh, of an exchange mechanism where the protein exchanges between the active and the inactive conformation when both binding sites are actually occupied. And in this case, we're using PROFAR as the ligand for his F and glutamine for the ligand for his H, and we get about 78% of the active conformation. Unfortunately, this profile is not stable enough to measure uh, long-term NMR experiments after around five, six hours it's degraded. So we uh, used another uh, ligand for its H, namely IMGP. IMGP is one of the products of the reaction. It binds uh, to the active sites of his, uh, of his F here on top, and it also induces the formation of the active conformation, however, only to around 40%. But with those samples, we can measure long-term uh, experiments and we can measure uh, longitudinal exchange experiments as I show here and we can measure how fast the active and inter inactive uh, conformations interchange under saturating conditions of both ligands. And what we get are exchange rates on the order of 10 per second and it's very important uh, to say that those exchange rates are definitely faster than the turnover rate of the enzyme. So the um, exchange rates of the enzyme between the active and the inactive conformation as, as, in, as depicted here are not rate limiting uh, during the reaction because they're just around uh, 10 times faster than the turnover rates are. So we wondered if the exchange rate between the active and the inactive conformation is not rate limiting, what is then rate limiting in the enzymatic reaction? And we thought maybe the enzymatic uh, activity is determined by the population of this active state here. So, of course, we can determine the population of the active state in the wild type situation. This is a spectrum that I showed you before, where we have 78% of the protein in the active conformation. When we change the ligand for his F, meaning this blue ball here, from the PROFAR to the IMGP, we shift the population to around 36% in the active state. And when we uh, use other ligands, we can change this, uh, this, this, this equilibrium uh, uh, even further. In addition, we can make mutations in the cis-F protein that shift the equilibrium also. Um, we can make mutations that shift the equilibrium towards less active state, and we can also shift the equilibrium by specific mutations to have more of the active state. And especially this D98E mutation shifts the population that we have almost completely uh, uh, only the, uh, the active state of the, of the enzyme. So having said this, uh, uh, if we want to correlate this with activity, we have to measure the activity. We're using NMR spectroscopy for this. It's quite trivial. We have glutamine in our uh, NMR tube. Uh, this glutamine is, uh, is, is, is hydrolyzed. We get glutamate. We can measure the rates. And then we can do this for all mutants that I showed you before. And then we can correlate uh, 
the activity that we measure here with the population of the active state that we see here. And we clearly see that we see an increase in activity uh, when we have more of the active state. But this is not a linear line. This, is a, this, this looks like an exponential curve. So it's not a direct one-to-one -one, uh, correlation between the active, uh, the active state population and the activity of the enzyme. And we wondered why this is the case. And there's something that I've not told you before, and that is that for all the experiments that we've done so far, we have inactivated the his H uh, enzyme. We've done this because otherwise the glutamine would be hydrolyzed within uh, the short times and we could not measure any NMR spectrum. So we wondered now if this mutation that we made in the active site of his H actually influences the population of the active state. And in order to probe this, we started to do NMR experiments with the wild type protein. So those are spectrum on the left that I showed you before. This is his FH with the, his F ligand fully saturating conditions with the inactivating mutation such that this glutamine is not hydrolyzed. Here we see 78% active state. Here we see almost 100% of the active state when we in addition have this D98E mutation in his F. When we now remove this, uh, this, this, this mutation here that inactivates the enzyme and we're using the wild type protein. So now we're having um, the enzyme under multiple turnover conditions. We don't see any of the active state of the enzyme anymore. And when we add this activating mutation here, we only see a little bit of the active state of the enzyme. And this tells us directly that having this very conservative point mutation in the active site of his, his, his ACE here, shifts the equilibrium between those states towards the active conformation. And this of course prevents then uh, the, uh, sorry, this prevents that we get a linear relationship uh, here because the population that we measure in the inactive uh, state is not the population that we have uh, during our uh, multiple turnover uh, catalytic experiments. So in order to get, uh, to, to still uh, understand if the uh, population of this active state is actually determining the activity of this complex, we took uh, like, uh, like uh, 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 another way. What we can do is we can introduce mutations in the enzyme here that uh, shifts the equilibrium between those two, en those two states. And from this, we can calculate the uh, free energy change that this mutation uh, um, uh, has on the, uh, and thereby changes the population here. So we can calculate a delta delta G uh, from a certain point mutation that is located here or by uh, changing the, uh, the ligand here for the His F uh, protein. And what we assume is that this change in free energy uh, is independent uh, from the fact if we have the wild type protein here or the inactivating mutation here on his H. And this is a very likely or a very reasonable assumption because the mutations to shift the populations are all located up here, whereas this mutation is uh, to inactivate the protein is located down here. So now if we assume that the catalytic activity is solely determined by the population of this active conformation, and in addition, if we assume that this active conformation has actually a very low population, which is definitely true because we don't see it during multiple turnover, uh, we can expect a linear relationship between our delta delta G of the mutation and the natural logarithm of the turnover rates. And if we do this, we expect a slope of minus one divided by RT. So if we now make the plot, uh, this is the wild type protein, has a delta delta G of zero. Uh, those are mutations that shift the populations um, towards the inactive state uh, with specific delta delta Gs. Those are the activities here. We definitely get a linear relationship between uh, delta delta G and the uh, natural logarithm of the activity. Um, and the expected slope is indeed minus one divided by RT. And this uh, tells us that the activity of this uh, protein complex here is solely determined by the population of this active conformation here. And the population of this active conformation here can of course be modulated with different uh, ligands here and with different mutations uh, in the protein here. So with that I'd like to come to an end and tell you uh, what we learned here. Here we basically have an allosteric signaling process in the enzyme through a shift in the conformational equilibrium. We have the APO protein, it can recruit one ligand, the protein stays in the inactive conformation. We have to recruit the second ligand. And when the second ligand has been recruited, the protein starts to um, 
undergo conformational changes between the inactive form and the active form and the population of this active form then ultimately determines the turnover rate of this enzyme and uh, with this I think we've got uh, quite nice insights into how allosteric signaling uh, is, uh, is, is communicated and how it is modulated in a central uh, metabolic enzyme. All right, with that, uh, I'd like to come to an end. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Philip Wurm and Anna Fuchs who have worked on the DCPS and the his FH projects extensively. I'd like to thank Reinhard Sterner and Shi Hong Sung, Matthias Wilmans that we collaborated with on the his FH project. And I also really like to uh, take the opportunity to thank uh, the people in my lab for their, for their very nice work and for their enthusiasm for science. And I hope to have convinced you that NMR is actually a very powerful technique to uh, study how conformational changes in enzymes are used to regulate activity or how they're used to uh, transmit uh, allosteric signals uh, in proteins. And with that, uh, thanks again for listening and um, that's it. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Renko, for this uh, fantastic talk. Uh, there are several questions. Uh, if at any point you have more, please uh, type them at the Q&A. Some of them will be answered now. Perhaps some of them have to be uh, have to wait until the informal session. Also, the panelists, if you have any questions, please, uh, please interrupt me. So, uh, Paul Shanda uh, says, always a pleasure to listen to your talks. Uh, question related to the his FH part. Do you see the structural changes? e.g. loop closure already in the presence of only profar. Did I get it right that these changes occur also with profar only, no glutamine, but the population is small? So, so uh, thank, thanks Paul, uh, that is a very very nice question. Um, so when we add only one ligand, we do see conformational changes, but they're localized to where the ligand binds. And they don't, so they, 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 they bind, when we have ligand binding at HF, we see, the, we, we see something that, that is like loop closure but it's not sufficient to, to, to make the switch to the other side, to the active state. So um, we don't see any active state when uh, only one of the ligands is, is bound. And of course, one can do very, very nice uh, NMR experiments like CESTs and CPMGs and all those experiments to probe for, uh, um, for, for invisible states or states that are very lowly populated. Uh, the problem we have here is that with this profar uh, ligands, uh, we can't measure more than for like four, five, six, seven, eight hours. Then the ligand is just degraded and uh, uh, it, it, the, sample is, the sample is not usable anymore. Um, so we can't do like CEST and CPMGs to probe if there are very low uh, populations of the, of, the, of the active states. Um, but based on, on CPMG, uh, on HMQC spectra, we don't see anything. Um, we really need both ligands to, to, to um, induce the switch from the inactive to the active conformation. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I believe so. So another question, an easy one, how many histidines were labeled and how did you assign them? Um, well, all histidines were labeled in his age. Uh, I think there are four or five and we labeled, uh, we assigned them by mutagenesis. We just knocked them out and looked for a peak disappearing. Uh, yeah. uh, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. So Harry Babo says, lovely talk and, nice demonstra and a nice demonstration on the use of NMR to understand biological mechanisms. Uh, in your DCPS story, uh, there are a couple of isoleucines that were far upfield in the carbon dimension. Are they in the Gauche conformation? Could you comment on this? Oh, this I'm not sure about. Uh, maybe it's around here. No, we have to go back. Uh, there are, oh no, I have to go forward. So there are definitely uh, shifts everywhere, but I've not checked if they're in the ghost conformation or, or not. So I, can, I cannot comment on this. Uh, we'd have to look in the structure if there's any uh, um, relationship between the carbon chemical shift and uh, uh, the conformation of the, of the rotomer. Okay. So that's all I can say to this. So Ashutosh Kumar says, great talk for you this year. DCPS work in a longitudinal exchange experiment. What is uh, what is the exchange rate to capture both the states, active and inactive, and how does it changes with exchange rate? Uh, how does it changes with exchange rate is relatively fast. I, I guess that it means that how if change is fast. So I'm not I'm not sure if I understand the question, but. Uh... Uh, the exchange rate were measured with the longitudinal exchange experiments where we can see the buildup of those, of those cross peaks here and the disappearance of, of the auto peaks, uh, as is shown here in the data. Uh, the populations are always one-to-one. -one. So there's always, when, 
50-50, there's one closed site, one open site. So uh, the closed site and the open sites are always equally populated. There's no, no way to have an enzyme that has more closed sites than open sites. Uh, um, so that's, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, if, uh, so you can, you can retype the question if you want. I think that there are some typos in the, in the question. I, I don't fully understand the question either, to be honest. So uh, let's move to the next question. Uh, thank you for a great talk. How did you crystallize the bound complex when the substrate is hydrolyzed within a few hours? But I guess that this was because of the mutant, right? Uh, um, so this is done in Hamburg and uh, they've just been very lucky. Uh, the crystals were soaked, I think, with uh, the substrates uh, and then, then measured at the synchrotron. Um, they're at the synchrotron, so this can go quite fast. Um, so it just happened to work out. What I have to say to this that is in our crystal structure, we have three um, independent complexes and only in one, the, the substrate for the His H was, uh, was still intact. In the other ones, it was partially hydrolyzed or, or even absent. Um, the glutamine hydrolysis in the H, His H active site was prevented by the inactivating uh, mutation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, th I think it's like always with crystallography, we've just been very lucky that it crystallized and that we got a structure and of the three um, complexes in the astrometric unit, one, one showed what we wanted to see. Okay, and then perhaps th there are many questions. I'll, I'll, I'll ask one more and then perhaps we move to the next talk for the sake of time. So Rolf Willens uh, says that on DCPS, in RNases, the two prima OH in the ribose is important for activity. Thus, substrate is part of the catalytic reaction. Can this also be the case for decapping and play a role with longer messenger RNA attachments? The 2' OH uh, can actually be modified in certain um, species. It's a very nice question. It's, it's nice, nice hearing from your world. Um, the 2', uh, the two prime OH can be modified, can be methylated uh, by certain enzymes. Um, this is also happening in yeast, which is the enzyme that we're working with. We've not tested how this methylation of the bases next to the cap structure uh, changed the activity. Uh, we can make those enzymatically, um, and we're definitely planning to, to address this. It's, it's a very nice, very nice idea, uh, but we've not done that uh, so far. Okay, as I said, I think that the, the, there are six more questions, seven more questions still that, that, that we leave that for, for the... I'll for stop sharing my screen and, and, and I'll stick around. <laughs> <laughs>